Welcome to Ragdale Talks, our monthly conversation series featuring Ragdale alumni. In this month's edition, we're featuring Michelle D. Bowdler. She is the author of Is Rape a Crime? A Memoir and Investigation and a Manifesto. It has been long listed for the National Book Award and named a 100 must read books by Time Magazine. Michelle is the recipient of a 2017 Barbara Deming Memorial Award for Nonfiction and, in addition to Ragdale, has been a fellow at McDowell. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, Literary Hub, Hippocampus, Psychology Today, Gertrude Press, and other literary magazines, as well as in the anthologies The Anatomy of Silence, Red Press, and We Rise to Resist, Voices from a New Era in Women's Political Action, McFarland. Bowdler is a public health executive and writer who has dedicated the last two decades looking at social justice issues related to rape and sexual assault as a national advocate. This is her debut book. Michelle will be in conversation with Honor Moore, whose newest book, Our Revolution, A Mother and Daughter at Mid-Century, published by W. W. Norton, was recently released in paperback. Moore's previous memoir, The Bishop's Daughter, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and a Los Angeles Times Favorite Book of the Year. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, The Paris Review, The American Scholar, and many other journals and anthologies. For the Library of America, she edited Amy Lowell, Selected Poems and Poems from the Women's Movement, an Oprah summer reading list pick. She has been poet in residence at Wesleyan University and the University of Richmond, visiting professor at the Columbia School of the Arts, and three times the visiting distinguished writer in the nonfiction writing program at the University of Iowa. When still in her twenties, Mourning Pictures, her play in verse about her mother's death, was produced on Broadway. The White Blackbird, A Life of the Painter Margaret Sargent, by her granddaughter, published in 1996 and recently reissued, was a New York Times notable book. She lives and writes in New York, where she is on the graduate writing faculty of the new school. Michelle and Honor Moore met at Ragdale and bonded over strong coffee and conversation. Please welcome to the Ragdale Talks stage, Michelle D. Bowdler and Honor Moore. Well, thank you. On behalf of Honor and I, we're so happy to be here. It's so nice to see so many friends on the screen. And um, we're going to kind of have a back and forth. And um, I just wanted to mention, uh, first of all, how important being on this call with Honor is. Um, I met, we met at Ragdale and I was a brand new writer uh, trying to get this book done. And Honor was so established and and um, she was so kind and generous to me and I will never forget it. And we've since become good friends. And I also just wanted to mention, thank you for supporting Ragdale, uh, which is on uh, in Lake Forest, Illinois. And uh, it's a beautiful place with a great history and they were really generous to both of us, giving us space and time to, to write and to get to know each other. So thank you. And um, hi, Honor. How are you hi. today? <laughs> Where's the Dove chocolate? <laughs> yeah, we had tea and Dove chocolate every, every afternoon. <laughs> um, so I was going to start um, by asking Honor, um, before she reads, since all of you may not have had the chance um, to both mention her brand new other book that is amazing. There it is. Women's Liberation, Feminist Writings That Inspired a Revolution and Still Can. 90 <laughs> writers from between, feminist writers from between 1963 and uh, 1991. And um, since I didn't write, it, it 
except for head notes with my friend Alex Gates Schulman, who the co-editor, I can say it is a fantastic book. Yeah, I, I highly recommend it. And also just to hear uh, hear Honor and others talk about that time and writing this book was um, amazing. And we'll try to provide that link from the Library of America later. So Honor, I was gonna start by asking you to, before you read, um, to talk a little bit about the title of your book so that that can give people a little sense in before you, before you read and then we'll hear your, hear your voice. Well, like all uh, great titles or like most great titles of mine, uh, it came at the very last minute and it came actually while I was finishing the book and the, the Our Revolution, I always knew that I would call the last chapter Our Revolution or Revolution. And then one day I scrolled Our and then I realized that that was the title of the book. And what it refers to is this is a book that takes place um, in the second half of the 20th century, so or the kind of middle of the 20th century. So those were revolutionary times, but also it represents my, m the revolution in my mother, it refers to the revolution in my mother's life. She went from being a bishop's wife and mother of nine to being a writer, a very successful memoir before she died at the age of young, at the, now I think at the age of 50, and also my revolution and the revolution in our relationship as mother and daughter. And your title. Yeah, so my title, um, actually, it, it's meant to be a serious question, is rape a crime. Um, it was something that a survivor asked me. Uh, we were at a nonprofit event where uh, we were beginning to be a little bit discouraged by you know, being brought onto a stage to tell our stories and um, didn't really feel like the issue of uh, uninvestigated rapes and untested rape evidence uh, wasn't being addressed properly and no one was really being held accountable. So this person looked at me and said, you, know, you really have to ask yourself if rape is a crime, if it's not investigated and nobody ever is, uh, held responsible. And very late in the writing of this book, um, I think it was my agent said, you know, that sentence when I was reading the book really gave me pause. And I felt like it was leading, that it led, it led up to what the book was really about. And so we played around with having it as a title. And then we put the subtitle in to make sure people understood that it was a, that it was a story about somebody's life and that it wasn't meant to be cheeky but that it was meant to be actually dead serious and so that's that's the history well, I, uh, as a teacher of nonfiction writing and memoir i love that it moves from memoir to investigation to manifesto because in a mm -hmm. way um, many memoirs are manifestos and you know i think of mine as a kind of manifesto for uh, relationships between mothers and daughters later in life, which is, so uh, I'm going to read now. Michelle has very kindly allowed me to be the first reader, and I'm going to read um, two short sections. The first uh, is, takes place in Jersey City, downtown Jersey City in the very early 50s, where my father, uh, an Episcopal priest, and my mother, and their um, tiny little children were um, uh, with two other priests were working uh, in what was then called the inner city. And this is what, this is me uh, with a very busy mother. I don't remember thinking, only taking the shiny scissors from her sewing table and cutting little squares out of every fabric I could find until I had 20 or 25 of them. I cut squares from the sheets on my parents' bed, the clothes hanging in their dark closet, my mother's dresses and blouses. I cut my father's black suits, but not his clerical vests or black suits, black shirts, but not his clerical vests or black suits. I cut tablecloths folded in a drawer, my mother's underwear, curtains, and towels. No one saw what I was doing. Did I cut from my own clothes? I took all the little squares to school and pasted them onto a chart. And with the help of my teacher, labeled each one cotton, wool, silk, percale. 
it was an assignment to bring in samples of textiles and I was in second grade. When my mother went to parents' night, the teacher complimented her on the variety of textiles Honor had brought in more than any other child. That was how my mother learned why little square holes had suddenly appeared in everything. And this is my mother in her book. The teacher gave her an A plus and said that she was immensely resourceful. I agreed wholeheartedly and went into a rage which recurred each time I found a textile with a small square removed. It did not occur to me that my mother's dresses, the curtains, and my father's shirts would forever after have little square holes in them, that in fact I'd ruined everything I cut. I thought the material would somehow grow back and the squares heal over like a scrape on my knee or a cut on my finger. How else was I to complete the assignment? When the teacher explained what a textile was, what at home we called material, I thought I should do just what I did. My mother didn't have bits of material lying around, and because it was clear she couldn't stop what she was doing to advise me, I didn't ask her for help. Better to make my way alone. She was busy with Rosie, my youngest sister then, and with everyone who came to the kitchen and the girls' club, Father Pegram and Father Myers and Poppy, and the men coming to the door for soup. It wasn't hard to believe that no one noticed or noticed anything I did. I wasn't punished, and the story became one my mother told about this oldest daughter of hers, for whom she later wrote, the life at Grace Church was the least natural. True, I think now, except for the laughter and talk and the endless stream of new grown-ups at supper. An astrologer looks at our charts side by side. You drove her crazy, she says. We would never know, my mother wrote about honor in her book, where her intensity, her devouring of books, her play acting, her adult air all came from. She would plunge into the box of dress up clothes we kept upstairs and costumed in ragged finery promenade with her doll and carriage up and down the sidewalk, dodging trash cans, wondering we always felt when watching her why the world around her didn't join her parade. Oh. Now they are. <laughs> um, anyway, now I'm going to read um, the piece that um, actually the main sort of piece that I uh, wrote at Ragdale and really thought through at Ragdale. And we're jumping to 1963, 64. When five bishops laid their hands on her husband's head, he was brought into the apostolic succession, which Christ had initiated by consecrating St. Peter in the very same ritual. Mystique was the word my mother came up with to characterize my father's new status. But in what mystique did his wife participate? A clergy wife, she'd written, must figure out what God wants her to do. Would God keep Jenny Moore from becoming a sherry-serving bishop's lady? In July in the Adirondacks, she began writing the book by hand, my sister Adelia typing the first pages. Back in DC in early August, they moved into 3400 Newark Street. Some furniture too big for the house, so put it in storage, wild when they walk in and ask you where it goes. For the first time, she was keeping a diary at home. Once school began, she swiftly organized her life to have mornings child free, dropping five-year-old Susanna at kindergarten and three-year-old patients at a nursery school two blocks from home. The neighbors, the Dudmans, their neighbors, the Dudmans, were out at work all day, their two daughters at school, she could write in their guest room. For the first time in almost 20 years, she had time alone. And for the first time since abandoning fiction at Barnard, she was undertaking a narrative not the improvisation of scrapbook or letter, but an actual book. From her drafts, it seems she barely hesitated. In that vertical hand, she covered page after page of a yellow legal pad. She used a pentel, a new kind of felt tip pen she adored. Did her seeming ease carry over from writing letters or was it beginner's luck, beginner's luck? I'm envious. I'm nine days into three weeks at a writer's residency, Ragdale, where I'm working on this book. 
and I'm finding myself inarticulate on the page and frustrated. That afternoon, I have a cup of tea with another writer. Michelle, she is working very well, she tells me. This is her first book and her first residency, her first time free of her full-time job and two teenage children. I can't believe how deep I'm able to go, she tells me. What innocence, as it was for my mother in the Dudman's guest room. Her solitude itself is a victory. In letters and her diary, my mother didn't reveal much. I am working on the book, she wrote to me. Where's her advice? I am, as usual, trying to wrest conversation from what my mother left behind. I remember the striking phrase in the diary she kept on that trip to Europe when I was 14, tried to cross terrifying, slippery places. I'll take the liberty of turning it into a question. What made it so terrifying for you to cross into the slippery places of self-revelation? My mother isn't here to answer. Some months later, I took a day to sort again through the photocopied legal-sized pages of her miscellaneous writing. I'd been over and over them for years, but now suddenly at the top of the page, there appeared a sentence I'd never read. I was almost always we, and now I'm I. The page had no date, but I'll assume the issue of I first came up when she began writing her book. Using the first person singular is a decision of language, but also a decision about who occupies the center of the story. Wow. Honor. I think I could just listen to you. I think we could all just listen to you read all night. My goodness. Oh, just well, thank gorgeous. you. Gorgeous. Just beautiful. Um, do you mind? So I want to let people know that the, the, um, the chat is open. And if you want to ask something uh, of either of us, we can try to pay attention to it as we go along. And and if, and if that's hard for us to do, we will do it at the end. But please feel free to ask a question or even just to, just to comment on what you just read. Um, Honor, I, I was going to ask you just to start. Um, you know, in writing memoir, this book is, so, is, is different in so many ways because there's another voice heard. And that voice is your mother. And and you have a convention of using italics so that the reader is never confused about who the writer is. Um, what was that like incorporating her voice in the writing? Um, well, like? it, it, yeah. it's great that you asked that because actually my mother, uh, when she died at 50 left, she published one book and she had all this unfinished material. And she, I had published one poem I was 27 years old and she left me uh, her unfinished writing um, in her will, cartons and cartons, which I carried with me for 40 years as I made my own way as a writer, always sort of wondering what I was gonna do with this stuff. And uh, although I referenced it for, for the book about her mother, The White Black Bird and the book about my father, I didn't really deeply go into it. Um, and so that's what I did. That's in a way what sort of dragged me a little kicking and screaming at the beginning to write to writing this book. And then I um, and I wanted to sort of honor this work that she hadn't finished, um, which grew to be not only unfinished writing from the end of her life, but also childhood writing and college writing and letters, 2000 pages of letters between my parents during their courtship, which took place almost, was during the war, so it took place almost entirely on paper. And then I just had the idea that I, I, I decided to put her language in italics, but then it turned out to be a really fantastic device because I could, I could just put one word in the middle of a sentence of mine in italics or three words or a page or a paragraph or in one case, I do longer than that, maybe even, you know, I don't know how long the fiction she wrote about being in the mental hospital was, four or five pages. So I was very um, gratified at how well it worked out as, as a device. Because, and it's, um, 
the writer Susan Ware wrote, reviewed my book, The White Blackbird in the New York Times. And I remember her saying that sometimes that book seemed like a duet between my grandmother and myself. Mm. And I always kept, I thought it was a beautiful idea. And so in this book, I actually, um, you know, it actually is in a, in a way a, a duet. It, it, I think it truly is. And, and, and just one last question um, before we, we pivot at all. Um, you've written three memoirs and I'm wondering particularly in writing about your father's, I don't wanna say your father's story, but more about your father and then this one more about your mother and your relationship. Um, was there, an, was there a difference in terms of what it felt like to do the writing, um, to tell the story? Yeah. Whatever part um, you'd like to talk about, yeah. Well, uh, I, I don't, this is an un, untested, unthought through theory, but I have this theory that men's lives are sort of like this and women's lives are like this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I really had the sense at every chapter that I was writing about a new woman. And mm -hmm. my mother had owned this uh, Courier and Ives, 19th century Courier and Ives print of the different stages of a woman's life, sort of on a, on a pyramid. And I sort of played off of those old fashioned categories and sort of invented my own um, stages uh, of her, her life. Um, and whereas the book about my father, in part because he died right before I started writing it, came out, sort of came out much faster. And the book about my mother, since she had been dead 40 years and I had to kind of conjure her um, mm -hmm. to, to feel her, uh, to start writing it, uh, you know, took much longer. It, you know, it took longer and it was more arduous in a way. Plus there was the technical uh, challenge of, of the, um, her getting her language into it properly. Yes, and going through so much material. So, yeah. yeah. So, so um, Michelle. Yes. I'm going to give it to you. Okay. And um, this book is so extraordinary. Um, as I said, how it moves from memoir to, um, to investigation, to manifesto. And, um, but it actually never ceases to be a memoir because your voice as a writer is so present in it and so um, caring throughout both of yourself, your younger self, your present self. And there's a, it is in a way, it, it, in a way you could say it's the story of a rape, but it's what it really is, is the story of a reconstruction of a self uh, which had been devastated. And I asked you to read this part about your, the family you made. And I, I wondered if you have still, uh, have you changed your mind or if you're going to read us that part? That, no, I am. I am going to read that. And I, I'm actually so glad that you suggested it because I, I, when I was writing the book and there was difficult material in there, I still have this, um, passion that or this belief that I wanted to write something beautiful and that you can talk about something really ugly or difficult that happens but that um but I really wanted people to know about the joy and beauty that I had in my life and so I'm going to read a passage about um when Mary and I decided to have kids and uh so uh, so there you have it. So I'm gonna, I will start and I think it's about a five minute or six minute piece. We'd spent over a year trying by doing the insemination at home. Every month, a dry ice encased tank appeared on our porch delivered from a lesbian owned California cryobank recommended by friends. After wheeling it into the house on a dolly, it took muscle to open the hatch and extract the half inch tall cylinder and put it directly into the fridge. After several failed attempts, we had the sperm delivered to a fertility clinic where an intrauterine insemination resulted in Mary getting pregnant right away. We went to the OBGYN clinic together for a routine ultrasound about halfway through the pregnancy. The technologist brought us into an exam room and Mary lifted her shirt, exposing her belly. 
I stood next to her, staring at the screen as bluish jelly was squeezed onto her middle and the wand moved back and forth. The familiar swishing sound filled the room. That's the heartbeat and it sounds great. Look, there's the outline of the spine, the head, the feet. She pointed as each at, as, e, as she named the parts, avoiding pronouns. Do you wanna know the sex? Because if you look at the screen for a few seconds, it's pretty obvious. And it was. There, along with fingers and toes, head and spine, sat a body part I was pretty unfamiliar with, representing a gender completely remote to me. Sometimes I imagined men as alien beings I knew were out there in the world, but whom I had banished for self-preservation from my home, my bed, my heart. How was I going to do this? This little being would be my son soon and for the rest of my life. There would be boy clothes and underwear and boy needs stretching me as a new parent, and I had no idea how to do any of it. Someday, there would be a young man living with us who would need me to parent him and help him learn how to become an adult in this world, a gentle and loving person, a man who asks permission, who understands he can't just take what he wants without asking. Maybe, just maybe, he would be like my father, who taught me how to ride a bike or open a fossil. I thought of him then and begged my father to help me push away my fears and simply love this child with everything I had, the way he had once loved me. Seeing that tiny vulnerable body on the screen softened my defenses and familiar or not, I was going all in, already in love with him. Can we name him Benjamin Gilbert? I asked Mary, still staring at his floating impression. It's my dad's name backwards. Instead of Gilbert Benowitz, he'll be Benjamin Gilbert. It would make me so happy and so much less scared somehow. Do you mind? There's not one single thing about that request I mind in the slightest. She smiled up at me. You're going to be a great parent to Ben. She said his name for the first time and I couldn't imagine having to wait another several months to meet him. All this baby needs is your love. And I know from experience what an amazing gift that is. The terror I felt when I first saw Benjamin on the ultrasound was replaced with something else, unambivalent joy. I had to try on this unfamiliar feeling. It felt great. The day we brought Benjamin home from the hospital, he was so tiny, wearing a yellow knitted cap and swaddled in a matching blanket. The three of us were exhausted by 7 p.m. And we've been told by more experienced parents to sleep whenever the baby sleeps to survive the first few weeks. We raced to bed. Ben would be staying in our bedroom in a little wooden cradle we borrowed from friends. He was right next to my side of the bed, less than an arm's length away. Mary was slumbering the instant her head hit the pillow and Benjamin was sleeping as well. I got into bed realizing there was no way I could sleep. I touched Mary's shoulder gently, probably shook her, thinking about shaking it hard if she didn't wake up. What if something happens to him in the middle of the night, I said. What were we thinking? Okay, she said, struggling to sit up. He's going to be okay, but here's what we'll do. Let's put up a little prayer into the universe and see if that helps. It doesn't matter if you believe or not, do it anyway. I held her hand, not arguing. God, goddess, Buddha, mother earth, or whatever spirit might be in this universe, she said. Thank you so much for bringing this wonderful, sweet, beautiful child into our lives. We pray that nothing happens to him and you keep him safe. But if it does, thank you so much for even these few days you've given us. Nothing will ever undo the joy we've had with him. Now we really do need to get some rest so that we can take care of this little baby. And please help Mishy put her fears away for tonight so we can all get some sleep. Mary looked right at me. We really do need to sleep, she said, touching my arm. Do you want to say anything? I repeated her sentiment. We wouldn't trade these days for anything. So thank you. And I guess we need to try and sleep. My voice was quiet and I felt so small. Can you please help us keep him safe, I said to no one in particular. Two years after our daughter Rebecca is born, she too is spectacular. An unexpected redhead whose eyes twinkle like Mary's 
and whose smile fills me with such love I'm overcome. In these early days of early parenting, my joy was occasionally interrupted by the residue of trauma. But mostly when I look at both of our children, my body thrummed, a ballet dancer in midair, exultant and unafraid in a moment of flight. My heart opened to every possibility I thought I'd buried. It felt like a minor miracle that I could let myself take the risk of caring this deeply again, of chancing something, anything, so precious and so fragile. It was this ability to care once again and love deeply that drove me to look into my cold case. I wanted a different world for my children. And most of all, to be a parent who showed, who showed them that injustice and the harm it does cannot stand and that self-regard can help you find what you once believed was lost. So great. So, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of how um, memoir really, um, I think writing memoir is a transformational um, process, but I also think that, uh, Right, you know, memoir itself can inspire trans transformation, and is and the subject is often transformation. I wondered um, what you thought about. Talk a little about the evolution of your book, of what you started it as, and then what it became. So it's had many different lives, and it started out. Um, where I just started writing again in my 40s. I hadn't written, you know, since the attack. I sort of put that all aside. And in my 40s, when I had started to struggle again with memories, I just started writing. And I was trying to figure out how resilience was built. I think I still have half a memoir that, uh, that I could work on. Uh, it was about my family of origin. Mm. And I braided those stories about my grandparents and uh, immigration and growing up in poverty you know, on the west side of Chicago. Um, I braided that with the story of, of, of trauma. And then I went into this writing class and at Grub Street in Boston. Um, and I think some of the people who joined me there are listening in. And um, the instructor said, write write the story of the trauma. I think you, you should focus on one of those for now. So then that became the book. And when the book was about to sell, it actually didn't have any of the research in it that it now has, which really is such none a- None of the investigation. None of it, none of it. And none of the things about the history of rape kits and emergency rooms dealing with trauma. And, and uh, both editors who were interested said, you know, your story is so moving, but it is, it is so many other people's stories. And, and is there a way for you to, are you willing to add in a little research? And, um, and, and I was so naive and so excited to maybe be selling my book. I'm like, oh, sure. <laughs> and, you know, seven months later and 150 endnotes later, it was a very different book. Um, and also just the original title, I, I, since we were talking about titles, the original title was The Idea of Order, which is taken from, yes, one of my favorite Wallace Stevens poems, right. about, you know, about somebody who's, who makes their own life and tells their own story. Um, and I just found, I still find that concept so compelling and so true as a trauma survivor, but nobody really understood what the title meant, like the idea of order. I still love the title. And um, so, yes, it's had many transformations. How, how about you? Did, was, that, was that true for your book as well? Or your book, your many books? <laughs> um, I, have an odd, uh, I have usually had quite an odd experience. It, it, all three of my nonfiction books have sort of realized the vision that I had for them at the beginning but they often went through phases of being way less interesting and way, you know, sort of ponderous with, with research, with too much research. And I remember um, in the last 20 years of his life, the playwright Arthur Miller was a friend of mine. And I once gave the beginning of the 
book to his wife, who was also my friend, to read. And then I came there for dinner. And to my horror, she said, Arthur, uh, read your pages. He, he wants to talk to you. And I thought, ah. and, uh, and he said, you know, throw away the research and write it like a novel. Yeah. And he said, I'm not talking about making it up, but, but you are the bridge between the story and, and the reader. And I, I, it's another thing I've always remembered. So I always, it's a kind of transformational progress, uh, process if I have all this stuff much as you did, and then you have to kind of hone it and um, get it sort of moving as a story. And I was thinking as, as you were talking that really your, your book is also a quest narrative. I mean, just yeah. as my, I'm in search of my mother, you're in search of, um, you know, the, yes, the rape kit, but it, the rape, you know, it's sort of, the rape kit becomes a kind of metaphor yes. for the, the meaning that you're in search of, just as the tr my mother's writing becomes really, it's really more about, I want her back, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes, that I think that's so, so true. And um, it's interesting that you say write it as a novel because I experience your writing as so poetic. I mean, it's, it, it, you know, it, it, you feel like you're reading a story and it's a true story, but it's just so gracefully done. I just, I really envy uh, that ability. I know it takes a lot of work, but you make it seem effortless and by the, by the final product, so. Well, um, and what I have to say to you and sort of mutual admiration society, I realize, <laughs> which is, but this book, your book could be a kind of, it's so uh, finely crafted and so absolutely um, specific, the, the journey that you go on and you stay so far away from sort of rhetorical cliches about sexual assault that it really, for someone who's thought about these issues for most of my life, it really renews the whole issue of sexual assault and, and rape and, you know, so on. So I, I'm, I was very moved by that. I, um, another part of the, of your book that I was, that I loved, and then maybe, I guess it's almost time to open it up, but is uh, the, there's a scene, the structure, the structure of the book is quite ingenious. Um, we don't really hear about the, the story of the trauma until quite far into the book. And then there's this um, scene that takes place in the apartment where the assault took place, which is a kind of Mother's Day party that uh, uh, Michelle and her two roommates invite all their mothers and grandmothers. And it's the most um, beautiful scene. And it's so wonderful where it comes in the book because it kind of reminds us um, about women. I mean, it reminds us uh, what happened in the process of second wave femi feminism, how women, you know, rediscovered each other um, yeah. across generations and, and so on. And I wondered, uh, I wondered about some of your structural decisions. Do you want to talk about them a little? Yeah, I, I, I yes. I, that actually was a really it's, it's interesting that you pointed that one out because um, I did want to show the meaning of home mm -hmm. and without without being clunky. So uh, I found out during my research that something like 60% of people who are raped immediately leave their home. Um, whether it's an unknown or unknown perpetrator. And, and I thought about, I thought about that apartment and how like I still sometimes when I drive into Boston, I'll drive past that street and I just, my stomach turns. And, and yet for about a year and a half, um, it was like this magical place. We had all just graduated from college. We were all crazy about each other. And, um, and it was a huge loss. It was a huge loss of that moment. And so 
here we brought our mothers and grandmothers to share this look at this life we made mm. and um and we all had you know complicated relationships with our parents and grandparents and yet there they were um sharing how joyful we were feeling like young adults and and i think and my goal in a lot of the writing was to show this is what a life is and this is what happens when it's when this part of it is lost um when you lose a job when you lose a home um when the people that you love are also impacted and um and so i wanted to include that but i didn't want it to be like a and then and then and then that was one thing our instructor told us don't make a memoir just and then this happened and then that happened um and there were other moments like that as well i think when i am at work and we are about to have a training in sexual assault and i hadn't really told many people at work what had happened and the very people who had helped me were the people coming in to do the talk and sort of just going through what it feels like to be the boss of a place that people think you know you have no idea and yet inside i felt like i was so small and couldn't possibly tolerate that and so um i tried to do that a few times because i felt like if it was just my pain my pain my pain it it wouldn't be readable and it also wouldn't give people the full emotional experience that a life really has well and and you know what you're doing is modeling recovery from from this sort of trauma yes. and you're you've made a record of it so it's a map yeah. you know it it's a map for others and it's a, it's a story yeah. um i mean it's interesting you know the first sentence of my book is it was a catastrophe yes. you know very different kinds of losses but the idea of what comes out of loss you know that what comes out of loss can be a uh, renewal and transformation and i still um didn't have a mother no nor did my eight younger brothers and sisters but you know this is what i made and this is what all of us made you know i wonder if uh if it's time to see if there are yeah. any questions and and while we so please um please open up questions there was one i saw earlier that i will ask um but i wanted to say just in terms of the word catastrophe like that i felt um like there was no better word <laughs> there was no better word it was like when you when you re reread that sentence to me i was like yeah that really was stunning and it's i'm going to i'm going to tell you what happened i'm not going to hold back i'm going to tell you what happened and here we go um so we have a question and so please uh please feel free to ask a question of either honor or myself um you have a question from mary who uh was asking if uh not only your experience of writing about your mother or your father the impact that that had but whether the people around you in your life whether like you have a very large family um whether there was a different um reaction to writing about uh about your fam about your mother or your father and and whether they were interested in you know given their thoughts about about well them. um uh the book about my mother it, since we all since it was a catastrophe for all of us i did have the wonderful experience of uh all and we lost her 40 years ago so we had you know more or less we had been processing it for a long time as the saying goes so there was a sense of um release i mean one of my sisters said i feel as if i have my mother back which mm. could be a greater compliment and then now you know she has there are um 39 grandchildren that she never uh met or 29 i mean there are a lot of grandchildren she never met and they're the dedicatees of the book and several of them have read it and i've gotten beautiful letters from them about what it was like to to get to know their grandmother yeah whom they 
you know, and the other thing is that for all of us, her death was such a tragedy that, uh, you know, I mean, I have a friend who wrote to me reading the book, I was always afraid to ask you about your mother, she said. Mm. You know, and I think that probably the younger generation, they've been afraid to ask us about her. Yeah. So that it did sort of open up um, her life and example to another generation. And that, um, you know, inside the family was a great thing, great thing. Yeah, oh, that's that's fantastic. And, and, and truly you did, um... You, 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 it was a gift, I think, to her, I, I must say, because you, you honored her, her work and her life. Well, uh, and I wanted to say, lest you all think that, um, I, I mean, this is not a kind of um, enclosing family no. book. This is no. a, you know, this is a woman who had, when I call, subtitled the book, uh, A Mother and Daughter at Mid-Century, we are in the mid-century and she's writing and publishing and she's an activist and she has all these kids, but she's also, you know, marching and, you know, demonstrating and getting to know Dorothy Day. And, you know, it's a, it's a kind of picture of a kind of white woman um, and a kind of world of white progressive people uh, that happened after World War II and headed into the 60s. And that story is one I really wanted to tell. Um, and this is a story that has, um, you know, a multiracial population. It's not um, an enclosed little story. So that's something for people who don't, haven't read the book that, that, that yeah. just to, you know, and it's hard along with, you know, it's kind of big novelistic structure, it's hard to give a sense of the entire book in just one short reading, so. Well, it, you know, I was talking to someone today that we were gonna be doing this reading and her daughter went to Vassar. And so I, I pulled out the book and I was holding it up in Zoom and I'm like, you can read about Elizabeth Bishop and and and, and Edna St. Vincent Millay in this book. I mean, they were, they, she knew them and, um, she didn't know she no. didn't know Edna but yes but <laughs> they were like the generation ahead of before yes, yes. They, okay, they that's true but their I was, vibration was around that's right and it was it was um that's right but the history that you know and write about is is really uh I find it stunning and a lot of fun so there's there's things in the book that are tragic there's also things that are just so elevating and, and incredible um it was funny she was funny. Yeah, she was yeah. funny. Yeah. And by the way, uh, there are some things in you, I, lest you think that that um, Michelle's book is like this, you know, yes, heartwarming and more, but mournful and devastating book. It's all those things, but there are parts in it that make me laugh out loud. So, <laughs> so it's like life, you know. That's right. It, yes. What? Well, so. Um, Thank you. It looks like we have a question um, to both of us, and then this might just wrap wrap us up. Uh, the question uh, is, and again, it, I don't know if it's Adrian or Adrian. I know you told me I was pronouncing Adrian Rich's name wrong, so now I don't make that mistake. Um, it, so Adrian says, can you describe your writing process? How long did it take from the beginning thought to the last word? I, you start. Okay. Um, I think truthfully, 10 years, I yeah. think truthfully, maybe even a little longer um, when it really wasn't what it became. And I think writing this book in this draft, probably four or five years. How about you, Anna? Well, uh, I think I signed the contract for this book in 2010 and it was published. Uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, no, yeah, well, I, I, you know, maybe 10 years, but really I would say the writing was really seven years. But what I, the story I want to tell about length of time is that a friend was clearing out her archives and she sent me a photo of a postcard I had sent her that was dated July 31st, 1981, in which I 
and I'm talking about writing the white blackbird and I say that I've finished 40 pages. That means that this work of these three autobiographical memoiristic books has been 40 years. Wow. That is more than half my life, everyone. <laughs> and I was horrified. So wow. I think of myself still as a, you know, 39 year old. That's right. I think that too, Honor. Um, <laughs> So I, I, it's time for us to end and I, I'm going to give Honor the chance to have a last word. I, I just want to thank Ragdale again. Yeah. Um, uh, it really was a place that um, helped to change uh, the way I thought about my own writing. And, you know, Honor actually gave me a lot of important advice about what, what I might want to do next what I might want to apply for. And it made me feel less afraid. Like um, I was taken seriously, even though I didn't have a book and I was hoping to have one someday. And um, so I want to just let you know that uh, Ragdale was a special place, not only for what it provided in terms of food and shelter and a beautiful setting, but really in terms of just the wonderful people that I met. And I think that is one of the values of some of the best residencies. So thank you to Ragdale. Thank you to Honor. And Honor, do you want to say Yes, any I want to say that um, um, since it was a very difficult uh, time, I was really sort of breaking the back of a certain part of the book while I was there. Um, the, the part I read you, I wrote there, but I also really got, something clear about her eye voice, uh, which was, you know, as Michelle was talking about, you know, the idea of a woman putting herself in the center of her own story. Um, uh, it was great that I was in a place that I actually couldn't leave. <laughs> <laughs> they would feed me and take care of me. And, you know, Michelle would give me chocolates in the afternoon and I would like, say, am I crazy? And I couldn't leave. It was snowing. It was cold. You could hardly go for a walk. So I would say that, you know, until the pandemic, before the pandemic, there was, uh, and my getting to know my apartment, there was, there was Ragdale and really uh, hunkering down and being able to hunker down in a beautiful room and with my books spread all over and the snow outside and trying to work the heater, which I finally did. And, you know, breakfast in the morning and, you know, labeled, you know, milk in the refrigerator and wonderful dinners. Um, really, it was uh, something. And um, it was a small group of us. Uh, and in that way, it's different from some of the larger residencies. So there's a sense of, you know, your survivors of a, you know, you will survive this, you know, amazing uh, time. And you can't leave until you put in the work that you're supposed to put in and, and you're supported in that, which is the great gift of Ragdale. Yeah, very much. Thank you. That's so well said.